1,500 miles, 11,000 soldiers, nearly 4,000 of them black, charged by a fateful time with a meaningful military role. Their task? Build a highway through some of the most imposing landscapes on Earth. Now, the Alcan Highway on Modern Marvels. A slender ribbon of two-lane highway transports more than 100,000 vacationers annually to Alaska and British Columbia. It was built around the Canadian Rockies during the region's most severe winter in history by men unfamiliar with the territory and the equipment. Born of necessity, some even saw the possibility that the fate of America could rely on its completion. 1,500 miles long, so impressive that it's been officially recognized by the International Historical Engineering Landmark Commission as an engineering marvel. The Alaska Highway isn't a road like any other. It's really a piece of history. People come from all over the world to see it. After more than 60 years, the experience of building the Alcan Highway, now known as the Alaska Highway, is still unforgettable. The Alcan Highway was the greatest experience in my life, other than getting married. <laughs> we didn't have no entertainment. We didn't have no liquor, thank goodness. We didn't have no you know, supplied by the government. A terrain where you could look and see Mount Sanford 50 miles away was really a experience for me and I enjoyed the, the vastness and the beauty of the, of the country. We knew we had a job to do. We did a beautiful job. And it's still a lasting experience that I never would have gotten had it not been for going to Alaska in World War II. Alaska's history, at least as far as the United States is concerned, starts in 1867. U.S. Secretary of State William Seward signed an agreement with a Russian minister to the United States. The pact, jokingly known as Seward's Folly, ceded 586,000 square miles of land to the U.S. for a mere $7.2 million. The isolated region sat pristinely for the next 30 years, totally ignored by Washington officials, until an earth-shattering discovery was made. Gold. The 1897 Yukon Gold Rush put the remote region on the map. At its height, 50,000 men and women raced to Alaska looking to make their fortune. However, Alaska's claim as the gold capital of the world was short-lived. By 1900, as new gold claims dwindled, so did the gold seekers. But even without gold, Alaska was rich in other resources. Mining, fishing, and trapping all flourished. This spurred members of Congress to confer official territory status in 1912. It would take 47 more years before Alaska would gain statehood. Originally called the Pioneer Road, the idea of a highway that would bridge the gap between the lower 48 and the Alaskan wilderness had been around since the 1860s. Finally, in 1938, a five-member U.S. Alaskan Highway Commission was formed to explore the idea of building a road. Alaskans had been pushing for a road to the states, what they called the International Highway, since 1929. Between the U.S. and Canadian governments, they surveyed and came up with two proposed lines, the A route and the B route, which was farther to the east. Neither of these routes satisfied both governments. Additionally, the Canadians wanted the new highway to link a series of seven airfields that stretched from Alberta, Canada, west to Alaska. The governments compromised and greenlighted a C route, or prairie route, a highway that would link the series of airfields known as the Northwest Staging Route. 
sea route, which would start in Dawson Creek, British Columbia, and end in Fairbanks, Alaska, was approved for several strategic reasons. The most important reason was that this route was farther inland, and thus less vulnerable to attack. This was a concern because of Japan's increasingly aggressive behavior. It was also more calm in the interior. Uh, it didn't have all the storms and, and uh, climate problems that you would get you know, on the ocean. And thirdly, because it was connected by roads to the industrial and commercial heartland in, in the United States and Canada. However, territorial bickering within the Canadian government pushed the proposed highway to the back burner. Escalating concerns in Europe would eventually play a role in the highway's birth. By summer 1941, World War II was intensifying, and the U.S. was getting more involved. Though not officially at war, President Roosevelt redirected 25% of the Pacific Fleet to the Atlantic. But the U.S. didn't officially enter World War II until one infamous day. of the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. Japan was now a continuing threat to America's Pacific Fleet and its shipping lanes throughout that region. If the Japanese could attack America's military bases in the middle of the ocean, what would prevent them from striking again? Only this time on the mainland. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, it is safe to say that the highway would have never been built without Pearl Harbor or without the fear that Tony Diamond, who was Alaska's delegate to Congress, said that Alaska was going to become the second Pearl Harbor unless the U.S. government did something to fortify it very quickly. Throughout December 1941, there were 58 sightings of hostile ships or aircraft in the Gulf of Alaska. If the Japanese controlled the shipping lanes in the North Pacific, they could seize a foothold in Alaska and push south to the lower 48. We Americans are vitally concerned in your defense of freedom. We are FDR quickly approved the idea energy. of building Sea Route. It would be built as fast as possible. The Canadians agreed, and the two countries divided responsibility for the highway's construction. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers would supply the bulk of the manpower. The war at that point was really escalating. People were frightened. We knew this was important. Alaska was threatened. All these bases were threatened. The cabinet committee appointed by President Roosevelt initially recommended sending four engineering regiments to Canada and Alaska. Each regiment would have 1,300 men. Eventually, seven regiments, comprised of 11,000 soldiers and officers, would travel by rail and ship north to territories where the wildlife population dwarfed the human population. With troops already thinly stretched across the Pacific and Atlantic, the pool of potential regiments to head north would have to be widened. If FDR wanted to build this highway quickly, he had to make an unpopular decision. Roosevelt assigned three all-black engineer regiments to Alaska against the wishes of his Alaskan commander, Simon Bolivar Buckner, Jr. It so happens that the commander in Alaska was from the Deep South um, and did not want black troops, and he protested roundly. And in order to placate him, the people who sent the troops from Washington said they would not put the black troops near any towns, no villages. He had said that if they came into the Alaskan towns and villages, they would interbreed with the native Indians and Eskimos and produce the worst looking race in the history of the world, and he wouldn't have it. The black troops during World War II had, until this point, just been doing housekeeping duty. They'd been manning stateside bases. They'd not been given any real responsible jobs. Black soldiers were given a rare, significant military task. They would build the highway that would thwart the Japanese invasion. The 
few residents of towns where the highway was headed were soon to be on the front lines of a social experiment. In February 1942, approximately 4,000 black soldiers traveled by rail to an unknown destination. We don't know where we are going. We will never get back home. That was the big thing. But it wasn't only black soldiers who were facing the bitter cold and an unknown assignment. Some white soldiers thought they were headed for Hawaii's sunny beaches. I was out in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and I shipped to uh, Fort Ord, California, where we were supposed to ship out for the islands. They'd taken our gun and rifles away from us and give us winter clothes, sleeping bags. It was for 40 degree weather. We knew that something was up. By March 1942, thousands of American GIs were riding the rails on their way to Alaska and Canada, still not certain of their mission or even where they were headed. The $7.2 million the U.S. paid Russia for the Alaska Territory represents roughly two cents per acre. The Alcan Highway will return on Modern Marvels. In 1942, Dawson Creek, British Columbia was a sleepy farming village with a population of 600 hard-working, God-fearing Canadians. That winter, residents were preparing for an invasion, not of Japanese soldiers, but American GIs. On March 9th, the first of 11,000 troops, including 4,000 black soldiers, emptied out of trains at Dawson Creek. Rumor got around that they were coming, and so we all expected them, but nothing like what we did get. Boy, there's, there's just trainfuls and trainfuls. U.S. military officials had decided to use a three-prong attack to build the highway as quickly as possible. The Dawson Creek-based regiments would work north to the Yukon border. The regiments in the Yukon would work south to Dawson Creek and north to Alaska. The last regiment would head south from Alaska to the Yukon. The soldiers were stunned by the freezing weather. The locals were shocked at the sight of so many soldiers. Regiments themselves were bigger than any established towns and communities in, in the north at that time. They had seven regiments of U.S. Army engineers, and they spread out. They went here and there. Whitehorse then was a population of about 450 people year-round. All of a sudden, in about three or four months, there were 5,000 people living in Whitehorse, and most of it was uh, U.S. Army personnel. More than one-third of the soldiers descending on the Yukon, Canada, and Alaska were black. Many of these men were from the Deep South and poorly educated. We all worked together. If you couldn't read or write, we would write letters home for the, the illiterate ones, and we even taught some of the illiterate ones to read and write. Illiterate or educated, this was still the U.S. Army and all black soldiers were still subjected to Jim Crow laws, a system of racial segregation. Following Alaskan Commander Buckner's orders, the all-black 97th Regiment was sent deep into the Alaskan wilderness, away from everyone. We had no facility to take showers and everything like that. It was a question of heating water in your helmet and taking a little bird bath. Supply truck sightings were rare for the 97th. But conditions weren't much better for the white troops. Often supplies couldn't reach them either because of bad weather or unfinished roads. Also, the best clothing the military could offer wasn't enough to keep all the soldiers warm against the Arctic weather. In spite of having lived in 72 degrees below zero, we only had frozen fingers, frozen ears, or maybe the tissue on their face were burned off. Many soldiers suffered from frostbite. Frostbite is often the freezing of the skin, usually in the extremities. In severe cases, muscle and even bone can freeze. If cold enough, frostbite can happen in just a few minutes with deadly results. 
More than 50 soldiers lost their lives to the frigid conditions. The battle against temperatures of 70 degrees below zero in clothing designed for 40 degrees above can only last so long. One soldier from the 97th died from exposure walking back to camp after his truck broke down. After his death, the idea came up that every 10 miles, a little shack with a stove was put along the road. So in case you got stuck on the road, you never had over five miles to walk to some type of shelter. Black and white soldiers endured the same living conditions. They lived in six-man pyramid tents, which limited their exposure to the elements, but were no match against the sub-freezing temperatures. In search of warmer clothing, one black soldier surprised an Indian village. The command in Alaska said they should not be allowed near any Alaskan towns or villages. There is one case, though, that I really love. The black bulldozer driver and his crew went through a very small Canadian Indian village. And a researcher went through about 10 years later and asked about the first time they'd actually seen the Alcan Highway Builders. And one of the Indians said, you know, the first white person I ever saw was black. Arriving with the troops by train were thousands of bulldozers, tractors, and graders. The mission was to knock down spruce and pine trees, lay an 18-foot wide gravel road, wide enough for two military trucks, smooth out the gravel, and repeat for more than 1,600 miles. A distance equivalent to that from Washington, D.C. to Denver, Colorado. To supply gasoline and other petroleum products to the regiments, the U.S. and Canadian governments created CANOL. CANOL would consist of four components, a producing oil field, a pipeline to carry crude oil to Whitehorse, a refinery, and finally, another 1,000-mile system of pipelines to deliver refined gasoline to the airfields along the Northwest staging route. Canal would be built concurrent with the highway. As the Canal project began, soldiers started getting acquainted with equipment few had ever used. These regiments were made up of combat engineers, trained more for warfare than road building. Most regiments would have 20 of the large D-8 tractors, 24 small D-4 tractors, 50 to 90 dump trucks, and an assortment of jeeps. They weren't the quietest trucks in the world, and they made an awful noise. If a convoy went by, you had to holler at each other so you could hear, because it, it went whooping by, and everything settled down, and pretty soon here comes another one. And this was the way it went. The first few days in camp set the tone for the grueling work facing all the soldiers. First thing you done, you grabbed yourself a cup of coffee. We'd get that down us, and then we'd have our breakfast, whatever it was, and, and hit the road. Hitting the road meant back-breaking 12 to 14-hour days, seven days a week. They learned by doing. You didn't shut off a car or a truck or a bulldozer engine. You kept them running 24 hours a day. When it's 30 and 40 below zero, metal becomes very brittle. It breaks very easily. The first tractors we got were not made for that kind of work. They were D4s and R4s, and we'd still be building the road if we'd have stayed with that equipment. But then when they come in there with the big D8 diesel tractors, we went to work. I never seen a D8 before. My God, that was a monster when I crawled up on that thing. But it didn't take me long to learn. <laughs> Using 17,000-ton Caterpillar tractors and bulldozers, the troops had difficulty controlling their equipment because of the rough terrain. The D8s were the world's largest tractors at that time. More than 15 feet long, seven and a half feet high, and almost nine feet wide. Running four or five abreast, the bulldozers knocked down and uprooted trees, cutting a 100-foot-wide swath. 
the second wave of bulldozers and tractors pushed the debris to the side. Following them was a regimental company that smoothed and graded the roads. It was known as the train system, all units moving forward, doing their job over and over again. The situation in which the soldiers found themselves was in a total wilderness. It's really tough country. They were building five miles of road, moving on. They were going into forests that had never been cut. They were going in mountains that had seldom been climbed. They were going into country that hadn't even been mapped. Led by local surveyors and trappers, the soldiers blazed trails over pristine territory. But as spring melted away winter's problems, it revealed new obstacles that could severely delay the highway's construction. Soldiers nicknamed the Alcan Highway the Oil Can Highway due to the hundreds of oil and diesel cans abandoned along the road during construction. The Alcan Highway will return on Modern Marvels. May 1942. 11,000 soldiers continued their push through the wilderness of British Columbia, Alaska, and the Yukon Territory. Four white U.S. combat engineer regiments armed with massive tractors moved quickly through the brush, cutting and grading about five miles a day. However, their black counterparts weren't as well equipped. They got the lousy jobs, they got to work with hand tools, whereas, you know, the white soldiers were driving trucks and driving bulldozers. There was a theory before these troops were sent north that black people didn't have the intelligence to operate heavy equipment. The leaders of the black troops quickly discovered that these guys were very good at operating heavy equipment, but um, equipment was limited. Sometimes the white troops would would grab it, and so they were left with picks and shovels. But they were very good with those picks and shovels, and uh, they were very motivated to do a good job. While the black soldiers were treated mostly even-handedly by their commanding officers, the lack of proper equipment forced the 97th Combat Engineers to take matters into their own hands. They used to once in a while go over to do a midnight requisition and steal a bulldozer or something from the white camp and build a big hunk of road with it and then put out a sign that said, this was built by the 97th. Imagine what we could do if we had equipment. Regardless of equipment or supplies, there were two natural problems that paralyzed those big tractors and bulldozers. Musk keg and permafrost jeopardized the entire project. Musk keg is a peat bog that freezes in the winter. It's made up of water, mosses, vegetable matter, and soil, and is only found in the Arctic. Musk keg can reach depths of 50 feet below the surface. When soldiers first discovered musk keg, they scraped off its top layer and pushed it to the side of the road. That was a mistake. You know what a swamp looks like? Well, these could bury a D8 tractor. As long as you kept moving, you, you were all right. If you ever stopped, you went down. And to get you out of there, it took a lot of work. As the spring turned into summer, tractors on the cleared muskeg swamps were being swallowed up by mud on a regular basis. When you get the tractor stuck in the mud up there, if you leave it running, the doggone thing vibrate, and it just keep vibrating down till all it'd be sticking out was uh, the stack, the exhaust pipe. We finally conquered the mud and managed to keep on pumping. We just kept going. After several tractors were disabled by the mud, the troops finally realized it was better to leave all muskeg in place. An old construction method was modified on site to traverse the muskeg. Soldiers would build corduroy road from fallen trees. More trees would be laid perpendicular to the road. The soldiers would then place a mesh of branches over the logs. And finally, soil would be poured on top of the branches to create the road surface. 
Permafrost was the second problem the soldiers had to overcome. Permafrost is ground that's been frozen for at least two years. Soldiers would park their equipment on permafrost, only to see the heavy machinery sink deep into the mud, thawed by the tractor's engine heat. Permafrost features are varied. From the air, polygonal designs in the ground are visible. From the ground, stunted black spruce trees are apparent. Using aerial surveillance to determine permafrost areas, military officials finally decided to build around it as best they could. The GIs were not only fighting muskeg and permafrost, but millions of mosquitoes. Due to a major oversight by military leaders, unlike the soldiers in Europe and in the Pacific, they received no bug repellent. We worked on the World War I camping hats covered with nets. We slept on the mosquito bars over our little cots, and there were a thousand mosquitoes per square inch. And in a lot of part of August, you had the little gnats that the Indians call no seams. They fly up your nose and your ears. They were putting our drove us goofy. I mean, they, you'd be in an enclosed pup tent, and it was a regular hum outside. The months-long daily grind of working long hours with no leave, being isolated from the outside world, battling Arctic conditions, then summer heat, could wreak havoc on a soldier's psyche. There were several soldiers taken out of the Yukon in straitjackets. They were in the middle of nowhere doing, you know, doing their everyday work, and all of a sudden something just snapped. They just lost it. They couldn't cope. By July 1942, the project, which was scheduled to take up to two years to complete, was running smoothly. In about four months, more than 1,000 miles of road had been built. Overcoming their daily battles with permafrost and muskeg, each regiment was now building an average of 10 miles a day. The novice caterpillar operators, known as cat skinners, were now experts. And the construction was going so fast that the construction workers were living literally out of tents. And they were moving their camps on a weekly basis, so they never really got set up for proper housing and hygiene and all those kinds of things that we take for granted today. Even in early July, northern parts of the highway route were mired in cold weather. In their six-man tents, soldiers used World War I stoves to try to stay warm. And they was like an ice cream cone turned upside down. And they didn't have no bottom in them. Just a stovepipe going out through the top of the tent. But you build a fire in the darn thing and you get hot. Later that summer, as the weather warmed, soldiers completely discarded the tents and fought off the mosquitoes as best they could. The primitive camp settings were an open invitation to the wild animals that roamed the forests and bogs. Bears had no qualms about entering campsites looking for a quick bite. Naturally, wildlife is attracted by, by the smells of cooking and, and food, and so they would come into camps. And you gotta remember, they had no natural fear of man then because they had never seen people before. So when soldiers started feeding scraps of food to the animals, and in some cases uh, became a nuisance. Some of them had to be put down, but uh, others became pets. These adopted pets were a small diversion for the troops that had bled and toiled for so long. The push was on to finish the highway before the next winter hit. In roughly eight months, 133 major bridges and more than 8,000 culverts were built for the Alcan Highway. The Alcan Highway will return on Modern Marvels. The 11,000 officers and soldiers racing to complete the Alcan Highway had overcome many obstacles since March 1942. By summer of that year, they had plowed through hundreds of thousands of trees and built hundreds of miles of road and nearly 100 bridges. In order to build bridges, makeshift sawmills were set up along riverbanks. We were sawing timbers 
that we needed to build bridges. We had horses up there to skid the timber because tractors would tend to sink in these places where we were cutting timber. And the cutting of timber was done by the fellas with crosscut saws. The troops had to build bridges across untamed streams, rivers, and lakes. Depending on the time of year, these seemingly innocent waterways could turn into dangerous torrents within a few hours. Some of them rivers were wide, some quarter mile. So it was a quite an undertaking. We did have a few accidents where things would happen. I seen a man get knocked off a tractor by a spring pole. And uh, the only way they got up to the hospital was on another tractor because there was no transportation. Not only was there no transportation, but the lack of army requisitions forced the soldiers to stick to the basics. All of our work we done up there was done with logs and all we had was nail them old spikes. And everything was done with what nature supplied us. Ice forced the soldiers to use new construction methods to build bridges. Its presence just below riverbanks where the pilings had to be driven prevented conventional methods from being used. On larger rivers, the ice present just beneath the riverbed was as hard as rock and fooled the troops into thinking they had sunken pilings into solid ground. But when warmer temperatures returned, the ice melted, causing bridge footings to slip. To combat this, the soldiers used steam hoses to melt the ice. The soldiers created holes for the pilings. The pilings were then greased, wrapped, and driven into the holes. The soil refroze around the driven greased pilings, cementing them in place. Greasing the pilings prevents a phenomenon known as frost jacking. An ungreased piling inserted into frozen ground can heave once that ground starts to thaw. Repeated heaving can actually force the piling out of the ground. But even during summer thaws, the adhesive nature of the tar paper kept the piling secure. That provided a firm foundation for the bridge. Every regiment faced these kinds of obstacles. But it was the all-black 95th unit that took bridge building to another level. The 95th was ordered to build a bridge over the Sikany Chief River in just one week. The Sikany is a swift flowing river, nearly 300 feet wide at the point where the bridge was to be built. Most of the men in that unit bet their entire paychecks that they could build that bridge in record time. Working with 20 hours of sunlight, the 95th felled trees, squared timber, and waded into chest-high icy water to meet their goal. They used long ropes tied to the riverbank to keep from being swept downriver by the current. The 1,300 men sang work chants as they labored around the clock finishing the bridge in an incredible 72 hours. Not only did they have the satisfaction of doing a magnificent piece of work, but they all scored financially. The seven black and white regiments that rarely saw each other and almost never interacted had battled isolation, the elements, and their own inexperience as bulldozer and tractor operators to build a serviceable roadway connecting the U.S. to Alaska. The troops had done so well that by August of 1942, military officials in Washington, D.C. felt the highway could be completed before winter arrived. As implausible as it may have seemed a mere five months earlier, the troops were ahead of schedule. Suddenly, soldiers used to working 12 to 14 hours a day were now granted leave. Every regiment had its uh, recreational officers that would try to liven up camp life, and they had portable record players. They improvised, they entertained each other. If there was a guitar around, that was it. The evening's entertainment would have been centered around any kind of uh, music like that, and that's universal. The activities that took place were baseball, softball, and we had boxing. Perhaps the best-known diversions for the soldiers were the signposts they created. 
the all-white 341st Regiment working in the Yukon, and the all-black 97th Regiment working in Alaska, built reminders of home that were equal parts humor and truth. Carl Lindley, a member of the 341st, started the Watson Lake Signpost Forest to battle his own homesickness. He had signs pointing to Tokyo, to New York City, to London, to a steakhouse somewhere in Chicago. It got to be famous for all those reasons, and then it just kept being added, too. These brief but necessary respites gave the soldiers the second wind they needed to finish the job. By September 1942, the southern section was finished. The all-white 35th Regiment met up with the 340th, another all-white regiment, just east of Watson Lake, at a location renamed Contact Creek by the soldiers. Attention now shifted to the north, where a 100-mile gap between the all-white 18th Regiment and the all-black 97th Regiment was the final hurdle to completing the highway. So the 97th had a real incentive because uh, their commander said, you can't go home until you build the road and you'll march on that road south. And once you finally connect with Dawson Creek, you can get back on the train and go home. The 97th forged ahead, blazing trails south toward the all-white 18th Regiment. Instead of continuing to build a road wide enough for two military trucks, the 97th followed orders to build a simple one-way access trail that would be widened and improved shortly after the highway was opened. On October 25th, 1942, with another Arctic winter fast approaching, the 97th crossed over into Canada and met the 18th near Beaver Creek at a location the soldiers renamed Soldier's Summit the road carved through virgin territory under the worst conditions possible was finished. Less than 100 soldiers died during the highway's construction, most from exposure. Several bulldozer operators died after huge branches fell on top of them. Despite these losses, a project estimated to take up to two years had been completed in just eight months and 12 days. I was most enthused because that meant going home. And everybody was overjoyed because the highway was completed. There were a lot of soldiers who they didn't think they would get back home. But we made it, and uh, thank God we made it. The official ceremony took place on November 20th. Dignitaries from Alaska, Canada, and the U.S braved the minus 35 degree weather as military convoy trucks rolled down the highway. The signpost forest at Watson Lake now includes more than 40,000 signs. The Alcan Highway will return on Modern Marvels. By December 1942, once the Pioneer Road was completed, the American and Canadian Civilian Public Roads Administration, otherwise known as PRA, took over. They would widen, straighten, and pave the road, transforming it from the Pioneer Road into the Alcan Highway. These improvements occurred as military convoys started delivering supplies to the airfields that made up the Northwest Staging Route. At dusk on October 13, 1943, workers from the PRA units touched bulldozer blades near Whitehorse, Yukon Territory, officially completing the task which started in March 1942. Traffic along the highway was far lighter than expected because air or sea lanes to Alaska had not been cut off. The closest the Japanese got to invading Alaska was in June 1942, when the U.S. Army killed more than 2,000 Japanese soldiers during a battle in the Aleutian Islands. The highway opened for civilian traffic in 1948. In 1964, maintenance of the Canadian portion of the highway was transferred from the U.S. Army to the PRA, now known as Public Works Canada. 
In the early 1990s, the highway was garnering attention as its 50th anniversary approached. Reunions and celebrations were scheduled around the country to congratulate the soldiers for their efforts. Still, recognition for the black soldiers seemed in short supply. The fellows who wrote the history book were all white. And because the road had been a secret, and because the blacks had been way out in the middle of Thule's and, and forbidden to go to the towns, nobody much knew they were there. It was easy to write them out of history. We had great pride in what we were doing. And the thing that disturbed me is, over the years, the fact that no credit was given for the work that we I actually did. And I wrote letters and I tried everywhere to get more recognition for what we had accomplished. Finally, in 1992, at a Pentagon ceremony attended by then head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Colin Powell, the black soldiers were officially recognized for their service. In 1996, another honor came the soldiers' way. The International Historical Engineering Landmark Commission cited the highway, now known as the Alaska Highway, as an international landmark. But perhaps of even greater importance was how the highway changed the perception of black soldiers and black people in general. There were 10,600 men building that highway. One third of them were black. And nobody had to tell them they were doing a good job or that they could do just as good a job as anybody else. They could see it. And when you know that, nobody's going to stop you. I think that's what made America become a more integrated country. Today, the Alaska Highway is a hot spot for tourists. The area's natural beauty and winding roads bring in visitors from as far away as Europe and Asia. Decades of constant straightening by PRA units have shortened the highway. Originally more than 1,600 miles long, today it's roughly 1,500 miles. The government of Canada spends about $25 million a year on the highway. Half of that is operations and maintenance, and the other half is improvements and upgrades to the highway. The region, in parts at least, is very remote. You're far from the kinds of services you need to maintain a road. Uh, a lot of the highway is still original. That means it hasn't been upgraded yet to modern asphalt. There are initial discussions to extend the highway to Nome, and perhaps even build a bridge from Alaska to Siberia. That would certainly continue in the tradition of the original Alcan Highway, making the nearly impossible a reality. As an engineer, the highway is a, is a phenomenal feat. If you think about it, 11,000 men were moved into the area. They pioneered a road in eight months, and the simple logistics of building the road were just, just mind-boggling. And they were basically told to go from point A to point B, and the men just simply found the best way that they could get there. I don't even think we could take on a project that size and do it that quickly today. I've grown from that experience in Alaska. It broadened my knowledge, and it had moved me to right where I am today. I wouldn't take a million dollars for the experience that I had, but I sure wouldn't give a red cent to go through it again. No siree, I wouldn't want to do that again. Fifteen hundred miles, 11,000 soldiers, nearly 4,000 of them black, charged by a fateful time with a meaningful military role. Their task? Build a highway through some of the most imposing landscapes on Earth. Now, the Alcan Highway on Modern Marvels.
slender ribbon of two-lane highway transports more than 100,000 vacationers annually to Alaska and British Columbia. It was built around the Canadian Rockies during the region's most severe winter in history by men unfamiliar with the territory and the equipment. Born of necessity, some even saw the possibility that the fate of America could rely on its completion. 1,500 miles long, so impressive that it's been officially recognized by the International Historical Engineering Landmark Commission as an engineering marvel. The Alaska Highway isn't a road like any other. It's really a piece of history. People come from all over the world to see it. After more than 60 years, the experience of building the Alcan Highway, now known as the Alaska Highway, is still unforgettable. The Alcan Highway was the greatest experience in my life, other than getting married. <laughs> we didn't have no entertainment. We didn't have no liquor, thank goodness. We didn't have no, you know, supplied by the government. A terrain where you can look and see Mount Sanford 50 miles away was really a experience for me, and I enjoyed the, the vastness and the beauty of the, of the country. We knew we had a job to do. We did a beautiful job. And it's still a lasting experience that I never would have gotten had it not been for going to Alaska and World War II. Alaska's history, at least as far as the United States is concerned, starts in 1867. U.S. Secretary of State William Seward signed an agreement with a Russian minister to the United States. The pact, jokingly known as Seward's Folly, ceded 586,000 square miles of land to the U.S. for a mere $7.2 million. The isolated region sat pristinely for the next 30 years, totally ignored by Washington officials, until an earth-shattering discovery was made. Gold. The 1897 Yukon Gold Rush put the remote region on the map. At its height, 50,000 men and women raced to Alaska looking to make their fortune. However, Alaska's claim as the gold capital of the world was short-lived. By 1900, as new gold claims dwindled, so did the gold seekers. But even without gold, Alaska was rich in other resources. Mining, fishing, and trapping all flourished. This spurred members of Congress to confer official territory status in 1912. It would take 47 more years before Alaska would gain statehood. Originally called the Pioneer Road, the idea of a highway that would bridge the gap between the lower 48 and the Alaskan wilderness had been around since the 1860s. Finally, in 1938, a five-member U.S. Alaskan Highway Commission was formed to explore the idea of building a road. Alaskans had been pushing for a road to the states, what they called the International Highway, since 1929. Between the U.S. and Canadian